You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech Podcast and also Future Tech Health Podcast. I have Tommaso Guidini, head of ESA's Structures, uh, the European Space Agency's Structures, Mechanisms, and Materials Division. Yeah. We've been talking about the 3D printing of human tissue to keep astronauts healthy on their way to a Mars journey or you know, other long journeys. So, Tommaso, thank you for coming. Sure. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Yeah. So, uh, is there a specific mission that 3D printing of human tissue will be used for, or is it just in general for any long mission? For the uh, time being, it's what we call a, a building block technology, meaning is a technology which we think is needed for long-term missions, all of them. Meaning in long-term missions, of course, going to Mars is the first one we think of is because of the duration, but not just the duration, it's because you cannot to stop the mission. Once you have started it, you have to do it completely because you cannot stop due to astrodynamics uh, reasons. So you cannot come back in case of an emergency, medical emergency. So you have to do it completely, meaning you will stay, you will travel for at least two years and then you will have a part of the mission staying on Mars. So let's say two to three years mission duration in two or three years even an astronaut that is selected based on his health um, very strong conditions uh, maybe can have a, let's say an incident for example an accident for example a burn on the spacecraft or or a bruise on the skin due to uh, due to damage due to a fall on mars uh, surface and so Hence, you need mm. to be able, because of the distance, you cannot bring them back as you could do from the space station and as we do from the space station or from the moon. You have to be able to treat them there. Now, um, we are not dreaming. You know, We are very serious, very factual. We are not dreaming to have a full transplantation of an organ in on Mars. Now, what we are thinking of is a serious option to have regenerative medicine capabilities in the near term or nearer term. For example, printing the skin is state of the art on Earth. So you can already 3D bioprinting skin on Earth. What we want to do now is mature this technology to have it available for space applications as well. Now, of course, the 3D bioprinting is not all of that because as I was saying, you we are not dreaming. So once you have the idea of have regenerative medicine based on 3D bioprinting, you also be able to. You also need to be able to have surgery, proper, appropriate surgery, hence uh, sterile rooms, hence uh, equipment, and so. Hence, it will not be the first mission for sure. But the skin, for example, is already something that you can apply as a patch. You don't need too dramatic or too invasive surgery. For the bone, which is the second priority, because we have seen on the moon surface, the astronaut have fell due to the fact that you have to relearn to walk, to walk because of the reduced gravity. Second, the, the, the flight suit is not that easy to move. And so all of them, or many of the astronauts who were on the moon fell. So the say, falling on Mars is something that can happen. And Differently from what happened on the moon, which was a very short or relatively short mission on Mars because of the duration, there will be osteoporosis quite, uh, let's say, um, relevant. And so falling on Mars could be more, let's say, uh, damaging than falling on the moon. And the bones, because of the osteoporosis, may shatter. Hence, the reparation, if you want the repair, if you allow me the word, 
of a bone is considered also priority. For that, though, you need to have, a, let's say, more developed surgery capability. Right, okay, so I mean, you also need someone that can do the surgery itself, unless it's going to be robotic surgery. But on a mission, I mean, you only have so many people, and Absolutely. there needs to be a lot of different skill sets. So Absolutely. That, that's the is right question. Is it even feasible to, to train yeah. people yet to do this? Yeah, that's the right question to ask. In fact, the capability of performing regenerative medicine will depend very much on the duration of the mission and on the crew, meaning on the number of the mission, on the crew members. Meaning, of course, the more crew members, the more opportunity you will have to have appropriate regenerative medicine. The other option is you will have a trained surgeon on board, someone who for the first time, for the first missions, will be a kind of a MacGyver approach, like a guy who can do many things, is a generalistic, uh, let's say, surgeon, uh, capable of doing many things. And then, as as the mission will be more, the missions will be more stable, more long duration. The equipment and the facilities will be will grow. Then you will have more and more opportunities to do regenerative medicine. The vision, I'm talking about visions, of course, because it depends very much on how many people will be on Mars, what facilities we will have, and by what time, that's clear. But let's suppose we have, to, we are just discussing about the vision. The vision will be to have, a, let's say, a suitable surgery room. Uh, with cap uh, robotics capabilities, as you were saying, we cannot do telemedicine because of the delay in transmission. So we will have 40 minutes delay, and of course, it makes sure. it makes it impossible to have appropriate telemedicine unless we will have something different. But again, this it depends on the mission scenario. You may think of having, uh, let's say, a space station, as we will have it around the moon. You know, we will have the deep space getaway that will be a space station, not around the Earth as we have already, but will be around the moon. This is on 2024 astronauts on board. We could have a space station around Mars also. That could be a mission approach. In that case, you could have telemedicine from the space station to Mars surface. Or else you could have, let's say, a surgery room on the Mars surface. This is, of course, not tomorrow. It's for a long-term vision. But there you could have robotic assistance. You could have virtual reality and augmented reality. So to train your your surgeons, your surgeons. So what you could do is instead of the classical telemedicine where you're sending a signal from New York and you are operating in, say, Rome, this you cannot do. But you can do something like a delayed telemedicine, meaning with the let's say with the augmented reality, you could train the let's say the surgeon on the Mars surface. Then, if you have an incident, say a cardio issue, then you could have cardio surgery based on training done on a virtual reality model of the astronaut to be let's say um, to be helped. Uh, that surgeon on Mars could be trained on virtual reality with top surgeons on Earth. And once the top surgeon on Earth will decide based on his performances on the virtual reality that he's ready, then he can go to the real astronaut. That could be an approach. Also, what makes a top cardio surgeon on Earth a, car a top cardio surgeon? Well, first of all, is very skilled, of course, is very knowledgeable, is very competent, but very important is that he practices every day almost. On Mars, you cannot have that, of course. But should you have a problem on your heart on Mars, then you would like him to be the top surgeon. So an approach could be that the surgeon on Mars will keep, because he will not have all the opportunities a surgeon on the Earth has to train, of course. On a Mars surface, you cannot expect to have that many, let's say, uh, surgeries to be done. It's good. So, well, in a but, way, in a way, you hope that none have to be done, but occasionally yeah, well, one will be able exactly. To be so, but still, that person, if it is on the occasion where he has to intervene on, on a heart, you want him to be prepared. And so, uh, augmented reality will be an op an, op an option to keep them trained. Of course, again, this is in a longer term. What you are seeing here, the skin and the bone, is the first step we set to have 3D bioprinting opportunities matured to a space level qualification so that we can have them as a serious option for 
Mars missions, for example. The moon missions, though, are not excluded from this because they could be used as a technology demonstrator on a real environment. So you have the 3D well, okay, 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 okay. So what for the past, you know, 50 years, have there been any medical contingencies on any missions that are manned, you know, including the space station? Like what happens right now? If someone's what in the space station and they have a heart attack or they bump themselves really badly, they bleed, what do they do? You bring them back. So all the astronauts are trying to secure, to let's say stabilize the patients and bring them back to Earth. If you are on the space station, you can bring them to any hospital in the world in 20 hours. If you are on the moon surface, even on a moon base, we will not do surgery on a moon, on a moon base. We will bring them back. It will take you few days, say two days, to come back from the moon surface back to Earth, again, on an hospital. From Mars is a completely different story. story. Hence, Mars requires you to develop technologies that will allow you to have options of surgery or healing patients on a long distance where there is no return opportunity in a near term. Right, but having uh, surgeons and medical personnel deliberately go, for instance, to the space station and work there might be a great uh, idea because then you'd see how we can train people at least uh, in different environments. No, 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 absolutely. absolutely. Don't get me wrong. I mean, both the space station and the moon surface, even considering having a moon base on the moon surface, are always considered as a very good and very, very credible and realistic, let's say, training opportunity. Meaning you will have, for example, on the moon surface, you could have, if you have a moon base, one day, hopefully we will have a moon base, then you could have that moon base being used to train the personnel for then the Mars trip. Um, in a realistic environment, though still in a safe environment, that is, you can bring them back should the, the let's say, the situation worse, get, get worse. But also, you can have an opportunity to have the developments you need. So, say, take the Apollo mission. The Apollo mission developed around 135,000 patents, so inventions. The, the trend was getting things smaller getting them lighter and i think uh, i'm convinced that we will see exactly the same also for the 3d bioprinting by developing these technologies for space applications what we will see is that the technology will get smaller lighter maybe portable hence much more available to people in the world even cheaper uh, take again the apollo example one of the the fantastic developments we got back from that mission was the microprocessor. Processors existed. The mission forced them to become microprocessors. Now, name on Earth a machine that does not have a microprocessor today. Right, yeah. Basically impossible. Every, everyone has. So I'm convinced that by doing the 3D bioprinting development for space, we will see a 3D bioprinting uptake also on Earth. Don't get me wrong, on Earth is already happening. I mean, 3D bioprinting is happening, is a very good option. Now, having it for space will acceler accelerate its development and its market up uptake on Earth as well. And the space station can be a, let's say, a trial uh, opportunity for many technologies, as we do already. I mean, many, many medicines are tested on uh, on the space station to be able to use them both on space on lo longer distance missions, say Mars, but also to be used them to be used them on Earth. Say the osteoporosis is medical uh, treatment are developed on the space station or are tested on the space station where you are, we have zero gravity, so you expose the, even a healthy person to, let's say, face osteoporosis, and then you can test the uh, medical treatment on the space station. So it's, it's an ideal opportunity. Is there anything about uh, zero or low gravity that would make certain surgeries easier or medical care easier? Uh, this is a very difficult question to answer. Um, by the way, I'm an engineer. I'm not a medical doctor, so I feel uncomfortable to answer that question. It's uh, out of my comfort zone, I would say. But, you know, just to come back to the skin and the bones, what we did was we tested the 3D printer actually in minus 1G. So we actually printed upside down 
in order to make sure that and to show that the technology works not just in zero or reduced gravity, it works even upside down. So it works even in minus one uh, G. So to say that that technology can be used in space conditions and can work in space conditions. That was another aspect of the development we have just achieved and we have just done. If you bring this concept back to Earth, of course, the the opportunities and the benefit for humanity are tremendous. Like imagine today, if you have a damage on the skin, say a burn, even a bad burn, you have to, re of course, you have to find skin somewhere else in your body and patch the damage with that skin that comes from another part of your body. It means that you create an unnecessary second wound somewhere else. Now, with a 3D printed skin that comes from your stem cells, because this is it, I mean, it's based on stem cells that comes from your body. So there is no rejection. The rejection risk is very, very limited. Hence, you have a new skin coming from yourself, but not being taken from yourself. It's being produced from your stem cells that come from your fat. So very, very simple technology, no damages anywhere else. And also the medical uh, companies are very much interested in testing their, their new products, new medicines on a skin or in a future uh, perspective, even on an organ, because our idea is then 3D bioprint even organs. Of course, this cannot happen tomorrow. The skin happens already. Right. For having a 3D printed organ, we will need to wait from five to 10 years, most probably, depending on the funding humanity has decided to invest on it. But imagine one day you will have a complete 3D printed, 3D bioprinted kidney, for example, that comes from your stem cells, you don't need to wait for a donor, and you can implant or transplant in yourself with no rejection. And again, also there, the medical companies, medical uh, pharmaceutical companies want to have these test organs to test their medicines on the organs they want to heal without arming animals or human beings, or let's say reducing as much as possible the testing on animals or human beings. Just testing the, let's say, the organ being reproduced to be simply exposed to those medicines you want to develop. I think this is right. something we cannot stay away from. It's, it's a, a great opportunity, great benefit for humanity. Uh, so the things that are easiest or most feasible compared to the things that uh, are most likely to happen, I would guess that's the overlap for initial uh, medical care type stuff you know, yeah. on Mars or off the Earth, right? Yeah. We we started with the skin and the bones because they are, first of all, because, well, we developed a strategy on how to approach 3D bioprinting and regenerative medicine for space application. So that strategy said to us, coming from top experts in Europe and in the world, um, we actually challenged them. We had a workshop on it. We challenged them to say, first of all, is it feasible? Is it possible? The answer very loud and very clear is yes, it is possible. The second question was, what could be the strategy? And the strategy that came out was skin and bones starting with, because first of all, very high maturity level on Earth on 3D bioprinting. Why is that? Well, because skin and bones are relatively simple kind of tissue and, and elements in our body. Cartilage is also something that you can 3D bioprint. As, as soon as you go to more complex tissues, for example, up to an organ, then the difficulty is that you have to have um, a vascular system, and that's the difficult part to be printed, but also possible. So. With the time, we will invest more and more in maturing these technologies. Now we want to stabilize the skin and bones technology for space, but then the next step will also looking into more complex tissues. Um, the very interesting thing of that technology we just developed is that it's fully natural, meaning it starts with your stem cells, so it's you, but in order to make it to, to have a structure on which you can add these stem cells that they come together out of the 3D bioprinter, we also needed a co, let's say, another element, but making the, the ink. The ink is made by plasma, by stem cells, so yourself, and then by a cellulose that comes from plants. And those plants can be grown 
on the spacecraft or on the planet. So it's completely sustainable technology that has the stem cells coming from the astronauts and the supporting material to make the stem cells not that liquid, but already holding the position, it being skin or it being bones, we needed to have a supporting material. For the skin is cellulose coming from the plant. For the bones is cellulose and calcinate, also completely sustainable. And then the beauty is that the, the stem cells eat those accompanying materials that are, as I said, coming from the plants and grow thanks to eating to the eating of this other element. So I think it's it's really a beautiful concept that is fully sustainable. And now we are working in stabilizing it for a space mission. So what uh, are there any specific breakthroughs that have already been made in the areas of uh, skin and bone 3D printing and or integration? So on earth, so, you know, to your knowledge are we doing this right now? Now what we want to do, now what we want to do is to make uh, like more and more as let's say we want to test and develop this technology more and more towards the space conditions and maybe even we are thinking of building a demonstrator to have it really tested in space conditions because the next big challenge of course will be the radiation radiation is something that is there not just for the astronauts of course but also for the um, or is a threat not just for the astronauts but of course also for the stem cells that you want to 3d print so on one side we want to understand how the stem cells and this we do on a regular basis, but we want to have 3D bioprinted uh, elements, possibly in space, maybe on the space station. And then we want to see how this, how they behave exposed to radiations. You can, of course, do that on ground, and this we will do as a part of the development. But the next step could be doing it on space. And then we want to see how to protect them. As we want to protect the astronauts, we want to protect also the machine that prints, the 3D bioprint. Okay. Um... What is the current bottleneck right now to being able to uh, 3D print skin and or cartilage and bone? So uh, bio, 3D bioprinting, as I said, of skin and bones on Earth are rather developed. And I would say are state of the art. Now, if you bring this technology to space, the, the major bottlenecks are getting the machine that you want to use smaller, as we saw it, and as I said, launching things to space is expensive and also you have a limit on the volume you can send you can ship so the first challenge will be to transform a 3d bioprinter that works very well on earth make it let's say suitable for space hence smaller portable hopefully and lighter that's one thing the other th the other thing is you want to make you want to protect what you print from us from from radiations first you want to measure the radiations and second you want to protect it from radiation the other aspect is you want to have a let's say sterile environment in which you can do all this, these things because for the time being we have done it in a laboratory environment which was sterile but now you need to do it in a environment that is a spacecraft that you want to be sterile as well. So you have to, let's say, engineer now what you have done on Earth for space missions. And those are the main tasks you need to tackle. Okay. So are you attempting to recreate this environment, you know, in, in your labs, uh, sort of a space environment or some aspects of it yeah. that you can test this? Yeah. What we want to do is now we want to be as representative as possible for space. Now, there are some limitations, of course, because, for example, zero gravity is something you cannot reproduce on Earth unless you go for a parabol parabolic flight that costs quite a significant amount of money. So we now want to prioritize activities to be done on Earth in order to, let's say, make the printer lighter and suitable for space. Then the next step will be certainly test this in a real environment in terms of gravity, which, as I said, Preliminary, in order to demonstrate that the machine works, even in zero G, we did it in minus one G, meaning printing upside down. Now, though, we want to become more realistic, that is, because minus one G is very demanding, like it, it's very negative, if you want, because it's not what you have in space. In space, you have either zero or close to zero G, or limited gravity if you are on a planet. So we want to simulate that, and the next step on a, on a more let's say spacecraft uh, uh, made 
3D bio printed printer, and then we want to go to an on planet application. We want to go for a probably in space, uh, say trial or demonstrator. Okay. What, what's the uh... I mean, the timeline on being able to do this, is there any well, uh, timeline, idea of one or is it uh, Timeline depends very much on the funding we will uh, receive. And uh, so it's very difficult for me to say at the moment. What is uh, What I can say already is that we have an activity currently ongoing to have this machine optimized on Earth, and for the next steps that is uh, in space or say on our, or say um, parabolic flight or in space, for this still I cannot answer because is pending funding opportunities that are not yet uh, available at the moment. Well, what aspects of this are you able to work on? I mean, the, there's the planning, you know, the so, logistics. First of all, what, yeah, for sure the optimization of the machine, for sure the making the design of the machine much lighter and much more. Uh, let's say space uh, um, compatible because at the moment is a laboratory machine so it's much bigger um, you need to make it smaller you need to not just make it smaller it's make it lighter you have to have the supply of the material compatible with the spacecraft also from earth health and safety uh, related aspect so this is visible this is something we will do and then the next step will do will build a real demonstrator, so to go for maybe even a flight opportunity in orbit demonstration. But again, this is the part I cannot speculate in terms of timeline. Gotcha, okay. Well, very good. What's what's the best way for people to uh, keep tabs on what, uh, what's being worked on and to get in touch with ESA and, you know, to find out more? Well, they could contact me if they want. Okay, and, and what, just go to ESA's website and then... Uh, yeah, yeah they can profile. go to ESA website. There should be either the contact details of our communication department. That's probably the best way. And then the communication department always sends the uh, messaging. And then I'll, I'll answer that. Okay. Thank you for coming. No, thank you for coming on the podcast, Tommaso. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure talking to you. Anytime, I'm here. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.